Catholic hymn 349. 349. Abide with me by Henry Francis Light. The hymn Abide with me is one of the popular English hymns of the past 150 years. Its author, Henry Francis Light, who lived from 1793 to 1847, was an Anglican priest and the vicar of All Saints in Brixham, England, a small fishing village on the coast of Devonshire. Light was a published poet and an accomplished hymn writer who also penned, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. For most of his life, he suffered from poor health and would regularly travel abroad for relief, as was the tradition of that day. Despite his compromised health, Light was a tireless minister and a devoted family man. He would often playfully comment that it was better to wear out than to rust out. In 1844, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis. For the next three years, his health deteriorated. On September 4th, 1847, he stood in the pulpit for the final time and delivered his farewell message to his parishioners, preaching on the meaning of the Eucharist. It was out of this context that this beloved hymn came out of. For that same afternoon, light, after a walk on the beach, retired to his room. He emerged an hour later with a handwritten copy of Abide With Me. He then left the voyage to Italy in order to get away from the cold, damp coastal weather. While en route, he mailed a revised copy of the hymn to his wife Anne. A few days later, on November 20th, 1847, while resting in a hotel on the French Riviera, Father Light went home to be with the Lord. A fellow clergyman who with him during his final hours reported that his final words were peace, joy. Light him was set to music to the tune of Eventide by William H. Monk, who lived from 1823 to 1889 and was deputed at Light's memorial service. Lord, always abide with us.
Catholic hymn 376, 376. Take my life and let it be by Frances Havergal. Frances Ridley Havergal, who lived from 1836 to 1879, created one of the classic hymns of Christian commitment. Referred to as the consecration poet, Havergal strives to live a life fully dedicated to Christ and to those she saw in any physical or spiritual need. We know that Havergal's spiritual journey began early in her life, memorizing passages in the Bible at age four and writing verse by age seven. She was nurtured by her father, an Anglican clergyman, also devoted to Christian hymnody. Though Havergal's health was frail and she lived barely for three years, she learned several modern languages as well as Hebrew and Greek. She was also a singer of some notes and known as an accomplished pianist. This hymn of total dedication to Christ seems to cover every aspect of submission to him. Each line begins with a compulsory verb, take, giving the sense of a continual prayer of petition. Lord, take our lives and let them be.
and 75. 75. Onward, Christian soldiers, by Sabine Barim Gold. Onward, Christian soldiers, was written in 1865 with no intention of ever being published, especially in adult hymn books. Though it was never meant for publication, it nevertheless found its way into a periodical later that soon it became included in English hymnals around the world. In 1871, Arthur Sullivan wrote the tune Saint Gertrude for the hymn which further popularized the hymn and has ever since been a standard melody. Due to its militaristic theme and martial melody, the hymn has encountered some resistance in recent years. Some church denominations have removed it from their hymn books entirely. However, it is appropriate to remember that Paul commands Timothy to share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3 and that he instructs the church to put on the whole armor of God because we wrestle against the spiritual forces of evil. <laughs> chapter 6 The words of the hymn make it clear that the focus is on this spiritual battle that our foe is Satan not men and that our king and commander in chief is the eternal omnipotent Christ whose kingdom cannot fail onward we march
Catholic hymn 373, 373. Stand up, stand up for Jesus by George Duffield. In the spring of 1853, there was a great revival in Philadelphia and one of the leaders of it was an earnest, manly, young minister, not quite 30 years old, named Dudley A. Tang. One day, Mr. Tang's arm got caught in some machinery and fearfully torn. The arm was amputated, but in a few days, the noble man died of his injuries. As he was dying, he sent a message to the ministers who had worked with him in the revival, and the message began with these words. Tell them, let us all stand up for Jesus. The words made a deep impression. They were quoted often before large assemblies, and they were made basis of more than one poem. Among Mr. Tyne's most devoted friends was Reverend George Duffield. A few weeks after the sad accident, he preached in his own church in Philadelphia, taking as his text Ephesians 6 verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and closing his sermon with the hymn which he had just written, Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The song at once became popular, was introduced into the hymn books, and became an especial favorite of the soldiers during the Civil War. Let us stand for Jesus. 